get going here, I guess. Uh, hi, everyone. My name's Kevin. I've met you before. Uh, and I work at Oracle Labs, which is a research group within Oracle. And in particular, I work on a team that specializes in virtual machine and compiler technologies. So I'm here today to talk about Truffle Ruby, which is our implementation of the Ruby language, um, and how we've improved our startup time with a new tool called the Substrate VM. Uh, before I get started, I do need to inform you that what I'm presenting today is research work out of a research group and should not be construed as a product announcement. Uh, please do not buy or sell stock in anything based on what you hear in this talk today. All right, so improving Truffle Ruby startup time with the Substrate VM. Uh, it's kind of a verbose title. I'm not super uh, creative when it comes to these things, but it is quite descriptive. So if, you, uh, if you're new to Ruby or you don't kind of keep track of all the various Ruby implementations out there, you might be wondering what Truffle Ruby is. Uh, so Truffle Ruby is, uh, as I mentioned, an alternative implementation of the Ruby programming language. It aims to be uh, compatible with all of your Ruby code, uh, but provide new advantages. Uh, compared to other Ruby implementations, it's relatively young. It's about four years old now. Uh, and I like to think of it as a best of breeds approach. Uh, we actually pull in code from JRuby, Rubinius, and MRI. Uh, like JRuby, the core of Truffle Ruby is written in Java, so there's a natural ability for us to share some code there. Unlike Rubinius, we want to implement as much of the language in Ruby itself. Uh, so we, we were able to leverage a lot of the work the Rubinius team had previously done uh, in implementing the core library in Ruby. And then we pull on the standard library from MRI, and more recently we've begun uh, being able to run MRI's C extensions. So uh, we actually run MRI's OpenSSL implementation in Zlib. Uh, we're currently 97% compatible with the Ruby core based on the core library specs from the Ruby spec project. Uh, and we hit 99% on the Ruby language specs. Uh, these test suites are really nice, but they're not as comprehensive as we would like. So we've also uh, spent a fair bit of time uh, testing the top 500 gems out there. Uh, active support is one that's really popular. So I use that as an example here. Uh, we're 99% compatible with that. We don't quite have uh, database drivers yet, but that's something we are working on. So we can't run all of Rails yet, but uh, we're closing the compatibility gap uh, quickly. So Truffle Ruby is implemented in Truffle. Uh, Truffle is a language toolkit for generating simple and fast runtimes. So with Truffle, uh, you basically just build an AST interpreter for your language. And an AST interpreter is about the simplest way uh, you can implement the language. They're very straightforward to develop. They're easy to reason about. Uh, they're easy to debug. Um, but the problem with AST interpreters is they tend to be slow. Uh, we fixed that by pairing Truffle with another project called Graal, which is our JIT compiler. So Graal is a compiler for Java, written in Java, and it has hooks from Java. Uh, and Truffle is able to use this uh, to call into Graal and optimize these AST interpreters through a process called partial evaluation. Um, and this is a big deal because a lot of languages start with an AST interpreter, and then they hit a performance wall and fine, they start building uh, a language-specific VM uh, for that. And building a VM is a lot of work. Uh, it requires a lot of expertise, and it's hard to get right. Uh, MRI went through this itself. So Ruby up through Ruby 1.8 was a simple AST interpreter. And Ruby 1.9 introduced the, the YARV instruction set and a virtual machine. Uh, so what we want to do with Truffle is say, hey, just build your language, stay in the, the realm of AST interpreters where it's really simple, and we'll take care of the performance part of that with Graal. Um, in addition to that, as a language building toolkit, Truffle provides some additional features like uh, debugger, profiling, general instrumentation. Uh, so things that all languages need, um, you get for free out of the box. In addition to some of the uh, JIT controls, so inline caching and being able to uh, prevent methods you know aren't going to JIT very well from compiling at all. And then finally, uh, Truffle has this polyglot feature, um, and this is a first class feature in the framework. So all languages implemented in Truffle uh, can call into and out of each other. 
And because they all inherit from uh, this base node class hierarchy, uh, truffle nodes from one language to the other can be mixed together very easily. And then when they're submitted for compilation with Graal, uh, we're able to eliminate that cross-language call boundary. And uh, so for instance, you can call JavaScript code from Ruby, and then when it gets optimized, um, there is no performance penalty for calling into JavaScript. Um, so uh, this is a, like I said, it's a first class feature of uh, Truffle, and to enforce that, uh, some of Truffle's functionality is actually implemented uh, as languages, uh, domain-specific languages within Truffle. Uh, so if you have been following Truffle Ruby, uh, you might be wondering what we've been up to. Uh, over the course of the last year, uh, we actually spun out of JRuby. So we used to ship as an alternative backend to JRuby. And at that time, we were called JRuby plus Truffle. Uh, we're now Truffle Ruby. Uh, we've begun running C extensions from MRI. Uh, last year, Chris Seaton, who was on our team, gave a talk at RubyConf outlining a blueprint for how we could run a C extension with MRI uh, and some of the work we've been doing there. Um, since then, we've now run OpenSSL, Nokogiri, JSON, uh, UNF, and we've begun working on some of the database adapters. So this approach is working, and the results are really promising. Uh, we now have Java interop, so you can call uh, Java methods on Java objects from Ruby uh, using a nice Ruby syntax. Uh, if you ever use JRuby and its Java interop, it looks very similar. And we've been working on improving our native calls. So Ruby has this uh, rich interface for making underlying POSIX calls. Uh, Truffle has a new feature called the native function interface, which is provided as one of these DSLs within Truffle. And it provides uh, almost like Ruby's FFI uh, that kind of functionality for Java and Truffle languages in particular. So we've been making some really good progress. Um, in the short time the project's been around, we've achieved a high level of compatibility. Uh, performance has been good, but uh, we, we've had one sticking problem, and uh, it's related to startup time. So uh, applications typically go through three cycles. Uh, you should have startup, warm up, and then steady state. And startup time is the time the interpreter uses uh, to basically get itself into the state uh, ready to start running your code. Uh, warm up time is when it initially starts running your code. And at this point, it's cold. Um, so it's going to be slow. And the idea is that as it executes it um, multiple times, it should get progressively faster um, to the point where we call it hot and thus warm up. So if you have a JIT, this is when uh, you'd be profiling the application, uh, submitting things for compilation, and actually compiling them. But even if you don't have a JIT, uh, your application could still have a warm-up phase. Uh, the operating system is going to do things like populate file system caches, and you'll be populating cache lines on the CPU, and things of that nature. And then eventually you hit your steady state. So this is where the, your application spends most of its life. And most applications um, hit some kind of event loop or, or something like that where it'll uh, remain up until uh, it basically stops executing. Uh, very few applications thrash around from there. So you could broadly classify applications as two types, uh, those that are long-lived and those that are short-lived. And in a long-lived application, um, you spend most of the time in the steady state. So. Um, Truffle Ruby, like a lot of languages with a JIT, or implementations rather with a JIT, um, will have kind of a slow startup and warm up time uh, and make that trade off because it'll generate very fast code for the steady state. And the idea is, is that your application will spend so much time in the steady state that spending that upfront time to generate fast code will more than pay for itself. But a lot of Ruby applications are actually short lived. Uh, we all use IRB or Pry. Uh, we have test suites. And in this case, um, the bulk of the time of your, your code could actually be in the startup phase. Uh, so here in this graph, uh, the startup time doesn't actually get any longer. It just now accounts for a larger percentage of the overall application's life cycle. Uh, and then you'll get into that warm-up phase, and that could largely be wasted work because you'll spend so little time in the steady state 
uh, before you exit that uh, you don't really gain any benefit from warming up. So uh, Truffle Ruby is kind of optimized for the long-lived applications and hasn't spent a whole lot of time optimizing for short-lived. Uh, so for the, we wanted to try to improve uh, startup time and uh, in order to improve something, it's helpful to see what uh, the current status is. So I ran a very simple Hello World application, and what we can see is MRI is hands down the fastest. It, it runs that in about 38 milliseconds. Uh, JRuby runs it in 1.4 seconds, and Truffle Ruby uh, lags it behind here at 1.7 seconds. Of course, nobody really runs Hello World in production, but I thought that was a a nice way to quickly illustrate things. Uh, to get a better sense of what a real world use case would be, um, I'm turning back to the Ruby spec suite. So this is that test suite I mentioned at the beginning that we use to evaluate our language compatibility. So what's nice about the Ruby spec suite is it's uh, modular. It's broken up into different components, like uh, tests for core language features, uh, tests for the standard library, and so on. And the idea is, is that um, multiple Ruby implementations can pick various subsets of this um, test suite in order to uh, progressively uh, add functionality. So the idea is, is you're going to start off with a new implementation. It's not going to run all of Ruby. So uh, you pick a, a subset or one of the components of the spec suite that you can start running and evaluate progress that way. So what's nice is, is uh, this is a good way of testing something that will run on multiple Ruby implementations and not favor one over the other. Um, another interesting aspect of the spec suite is it ships with a test runner called mspec that uh, looks and feels a lot like our spec. Uh, so you're going to have matchers, you're going to have uh, dot should and things like that. Um, and I'm looking in particular at the language specs. Uh, so this isn't the largest test suite in the world, but it's not the smallest. Uh, it has about 2,100 examples and 3,800 expectations. So uh, I think this is a pretty good proxy for what we can expect when running application-level test suites. M-spec looks a lot like our spec. Uh, we're running a decent number of examples here, and so on. Uh, so when we run these on the various Ruby implementations, again, MRI is hands down the fastest here. Uh, it's, you can do all those in about a second and a half. Uh, JRuby comes in at 33 seconds, and Truffle Ruby again, is at the end at 47 and a half seconds. And uh, this is really our problem. Um, you know, we're making great strides in improving our compatibility, um, but a lot of people that are running test suites and things like that discount us out of hand uh, because this part is a bit too slow. So you might be asking yourself, well, if Truffle Ruby is so slow and running these tests or just doing startup time, what do I gain for that? And our advantage has been in peak performance. So uh, to evaluate peak performance, I'm turning to the OpCarat benchmark. Uh, if you saw Matt's opening keynote, um, he uh, presented some numbers here in the context of MJIT. So what OpCarat is, is uh, it's a benchmark that the core Ruby team is using to evaluate its progress uh, on its Ruby 3x3 initiative. So basically, it's a Nintendo Entertainment System emulator written in Ruby, and it basically runs NES games uh, and presents a score, which is uh, the number of frames rendered per second. And Ruby 2.0 runs uh, these in basically 20 frames per second. So if Ruby 3 hits its three speed up objective, uh, it'll hit, run at 60 frames per second. Uh, as an interesting aside, that's actually the frame rate that real NES hardware uses. So uh, coincidences all around. Uh, Matt's had indicated that MJIT can run at 2.8 times uh, what MRI 2.0 can run, so they're closing in on that, that 3x goal. Uh, but I ran OpCarat with these same uh, Ruby implementations, and what we can see is that uh, MRI 2.3 runs about 23 frames per second, JRuby roughly doubles that at 46, and Truffle Ruby runs about eight and a half times at 197 frames per second. So uh, we've made this trade-off where our startup time hasn't been uh, as great as we would like, but our peak performance is really, really nice. Now, I've been presenting this kind of in the guise of short-lived versus long-lived applications. 
and in terms of application profiles. But we can make this more of a human problem by uh, considering it as a development versus production issue. Uh, so you typically run uh, you know, PRI or IRB in development or run your test suites in development. And this is where uh, you'll really have your short-lived applications. But uh, in production, you tend to have a long-lived application profile. So balancing between the two can be a bit problematic. Um, so I'm actually going to take a step back here and uh, relate some of the experiences I had running JRuby in production, uh, which is something I did before I started working on Truffle Ruby. Um, so JRuby has uh, some of the same problems. Its startup time isn't as nice as MRI's, but it does have a peak performance advantage over MRI. Um, so with Teams, we had to decide what we wanted to balance for. Uh, one option is just always use MRI and optimize for developer time. Uh, the idea being that if your development team can move quicker or they're happier, they can deliver more value for your customers. Uh, on the other spectrum, you could just say, okay, uh, we're going to always optimize for peak performance, so we're going to use JRuby, or uh, in this case, everywhere. Um, and the idea being that will deliver more customer value by having a faster production product. And then we'll just accept that uh, the development team is going to have to incur uh, some additional cost uh, just running tests and things like that. A third option is running a hybrid model. And I actually was never able to get this to work, but I'm aware of teams that did. And what you would do in this situation is run MRI locally so you get that fast development time but deploy JRuby in production. So you would get your peak performance there. But there's an inherent risk with that because MRI and JRuby have different run times. And while JRuby um, has very high compatibility with MRI, in these edge cases, you may see differing behavior. So if you're deploying to a different environment in production than you run locally, uh, you may have some subtle, hard to find bugs there. Uh, CI can certainly mitigate a fair bit of this, but uh, it's a risk nonetheless. And then you may actually hit some uh, technical hurdles because things like uh, the Ruby engine environment variable, or sorry, global, will have different values. Uh, you could have native extensions that are different in C than they are in Java and so on. So having experienced that, um, this is actually something when I came into Truffle Ruby, I was really interested to know if we could handle better. And uh, I think we can. So uh, at this point, I'm, I'm going to introduce how we're going to do that uh, with a new product uh, project called the Substrate VM. So the basic idea is Truffle Ruby uh, being implemented in Java and Ruby. Um, it runs on the JVM, but it, we can also retarget it to another uh, VM called the Graal VM. So if you run on the JVM, uh, you get this AST interpreter, but you don't have our JIT, uh, so Graal's not in here. Uh, you'll still run through the JVM's JIT, but it won't be as fast. Uh, the point, though, is, is that uh, we can target the JVM, and it will be functionally correct. Uh, we can also target the Graal VM, which is the JVM packaged up with Graal, and you get that optimizing compiler, uh, which is how we're able to deliver those opt caret numbers. But the idea here is to slot in yet another target, uh, the substrate VM. So the same code base now can be used on multiple VMs. The substrate VM is uh, really a different kind of beast. So it, it has two core components to it. It has an ahead of time compiler, uh, also known as the native image generator, and then it has VM services that it will link to into the application. So the ahead of time compiler uh, takes a Java application, it takes the JDK, and it takes any additional jars or libraries um, that your application could rely on, and it compiles all that directly to native machine code. So the program in this case is the Truffle Ruby interpreter. So the ahead of time compiler uh, is really treating Java just like as if it were C or C++ or Go or what have you. Uh, what you get out of this is a static native binary and the JVM is completely gone. Uh, that binary will then have uh, the substrate VM linked into it so you still have garbage collection, hardware abstraction, and uh, some of these other features you expect from a virtual machine. Uh, to help 
illustrate the point a bit more, uh, what I have here on the top is a, I guess it's a little hard to see, but uh, it's a simple add method in Java. So uh, it takes two ints, A and B, and calls uh, math add exact on it. And if you compile this uh, for the JVM using Java C, uh, what you get is the code on the left. And this is, uh, well, it's hard to see, <laughs> uh, but it's Java bytecode. Uh, so if you've if you've ever worked with Java, you've probably noticed that you have these things called dot class files. Uh, they contain Java bytecode. You feed these into the JVM, which has a bytecode interpreter. Uh, so it actually interprets your class files. Uh, and it'll run in the interpreter until it determines that uh, it's a hot code path. And then it would submit it for uh, jitting using the JVM's jit. On the right hand side, though, what we have is actual machine code. So. This is the output from the native image generator for that method written in Java. So what the, the native image generator does is it performs a closed world static analysis over the application. And uh, that, that sounds like a mouthful, but it's actually fairly simple um, if you break it down. So every Java application has a main method. Um, if you've never done Java or C, uh, it's basically the entry point into an application. This is a bit different than Ruby where you can just run a script and it starts executing things. Um, and in Java, we have this notion of a static methods, static fields, static initializers. And uh, they're roughly equivalent to Ruby class variables, class methods, and just code you execute in um, classes. So if you open a class in Ruby, it'll just start executing the code in it. Uh, so you can run things outside of methods and so on. But uh, Java main methods are static, uh, so the um, analyzer starts there and it determines all the classes the program actually uses and then all the methods used from those classes. And then it throws everything else away. So the JDK, uh, which is a Java's standard library, is quite massive. Uh, we wouldn't want to compile the entire thing into our static image at the end of this. So we throw away the code we don't use. Uh, it's closed world, so because at the end of this you no longer have the JVM, you can't dynamically load classes. So everything your application could possibly use needs to be supplied as inputs to the native image generator. And uh, the analysis needs to be a bit conservative. So if uh, you have an interface or an abstract class and the analyzer can't determine concrete subtypes for it um, at any given call site, uh, it needs to actually compile in all the classes that could be candidates for this. And uh, you need to be careful of that because you could inadvertently compile the whole JDK in. So we, we monitor this um, with every push to the Truffle Ruby repository to make sure that we don't accidentally pull in stuff we don't need. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about how that process works, uh, Christian Vimmer gave a talk at the JVM Language Summit this year um, where he gets into the nitty-gritty details of that. So what's interesting for us uh, on the Truffle Ruby team is we can kind of take advantage of the static analysis because when we load Java classes in the image generator, we're going to execute all the static blocks. Uh, we can push computation uh, into the ahead-of-time compilation process. Um, so as I mentioned, we actually implement a fair bit of Ruby with Ruby. So we have uh, core methods implemented in Java, but once we bootstrap uh, the runtime, we then implement, like for instance, all of enumerable uh, in Ruby. Uh, so the, the downside with that is every time you start up the Truffle Ruby interpreter, uh, we need to load these files up and parse them and set up the state. And they simply never change. Or Rather, they change when we update them, but then we would issue a new release of Truffle Ruby at that point. So there's a, a lot of duplicated computation every time you run things. Uh, with uh, the ahead of time compiler, we can push that computation into the native image generator and do it precisely once. And then when you start up the static binary, that is the output uh, from the image generator, all that's already calculated for you. So for instance, we're doing this to pre-parse those core Ruby files. So we parse them, we get the AST, and then we just store the AST as essentially a memory blob into the binary. Uh, 
And then when we start up the binary, I would just read it back out of memory. We don't have to spend time doing it in the file system operations or, or building the AST. Uh, we go a step further and we include all the encoding tables. Uh, so Ruby has support for 110 encodings or so. Uh, and each of those um, has uh, a fair bit of metadata that goes with them. Uh, same thing with transcoding mappings. So if you want to be able to uh, convert the encoding on a string, uh, they go through these transcoding mappings. And these are things that hardly change ever. So uh, we gain a lot by being able to put those uh, into the ahead of time compilation process. Uh, and we pre-construct some common strings. So uh, string literals that are, are used in multiple places. Um, so we don't need to dynamically allocate uh, the bytes for the underlying string. All right, so what does this gain us? Uh, the whole point was to improve our startup time. So let's go ahead and take a look at, at the results there. Uh, so as you might recall, this is what we were looking at for Hello World. Uh, Truffle Ruby was kind of all the way at the end here at 1.7 seconds. We run this again on the substrate VM. It goes down to 100 milliseconds. Uh, so we're not quite as fast as MRI, but we're closing the gap there. Again, nobody really runs Hello World in production, so let's take a look at that test suite again. So we're at 47 and a half seconds. On the substrate VM, we dropped to just below seven seconds. Now, uh, MRI still has us beat by you know, multiple times here, but I think for a development team um, trying to make the decision whether uh, they could accept this in development or not, um, you know, there's a big difference between waiting a minute for a test suite to complete uh, when MRI can deliver results in a second and a half and only having to wait an extra five seconds. So we want to get as fast as MRI, and we're going to continue to reduce this number, but I think we're now into the realm of acceptability um, for a lot of teams. A natural question, though, is did we sacrifice peak performance? Um, I kind of pitched all this initially as we have slow startup time so we can have faster steady state performance. So if we look at those op caret numbers again, um, when we run on the substrate VM, we actually do take a bit of a hit. So we drop from 197 frames per second to 169. Uh, this still makes us about eight times faster than MRI. So this is a, a pretty good advantage um, and I think probably a decent trade-off to reduce our startup time. But it is a 15% reduction and there's no inherent reason for that to happen. So what happened? Why did we take a performance hit? Uh, so op caret is kind of a demon case uh, for running things. It, it basically uh, decodes these op codes uh, corresponding to instructions for the NES hardware. And then in a tight loop, it uses the op code as an index to a dispatch table and then uses metaprogramming to dynamically dispatch over send. Uh, using send. Uh, so two things are going on here. Uh, one, it splats the results of the dispatch table, uh, and uh, this generates a very, or creates a very small array, and the substrate VM doesn't optimize the creation of small arrays uh, quite as well as the Graal VM does. Uh, so with Graal, we can actually avoid the application of the array in some cases and just access the members directly. Um, and the second thing is, is uh, the send call becomes megamorphic very quickly, which means um, we can't use our inline caching, which is a way um, that basically all the Ruby implementations are able to optimize uh, method calls. Um, so if you, Truffle Ruby in particular um, is able to take it a step further and optimize metaprogramming with inline caching. Uh, which none of the other implementations are able to do. And I gave a talk on this a couple years ago at Ruby Kaigi, if you're interested in how that works. Um, but the point is, is because this goes megamorphic, we're not able to use that inline cache uh, even at that level. Uh, so we have to do method invocation. And as it turns out, uh, calling functions is a tad slower on the substrate VM than it is on the Graal VM. Uh, so these are the things the substrate VM team is aware of and uh, intend on fixing. So uh, in summary, I think Truffle Ruby startup time is fixed. Um, we're not as fast as MRI, and that is our goal. 
but I think the path we're on is a viable one. And I'm personally really excited to say that Substrate VM is now publicly available. Um, if you've been following Truffle Ruby at all, uh, one of the things we're often asked or criticized about is our startup time. And it's a fair criticism. Um, I, I don't begrieve anyone for that. Um, but uh, when we addressed it, we would often say, hey, we got this, uh, this kind of thing on the side called the Substrate VM that will just, you know, make startup time faster, don't worry about it. And it was beginning to look like vaporware, uh, but it's now publicly available, you can use it, uh, and we're, we're relying on it. Um, and personally, I think uh, what's also nifty about the Substrate VM is it helps uh, validate the, the approach we're taking with Truffle Ruby, uh, which is building on top of this Truffle AST interpreter framework. Um, in addition to getting things like a debugger and profiler for free, now we get this awesome virtual machine uh, that solves our startup time problem. Um, and from the, the perspective of the Truffle Ruby code base, we really don't have to do anything special to take advantage of that. Uh, there's maybe a, a half dozen different code paths where we need to um, disable some things um, because they rely on reflection and things like that that aren't available in the Substrate VM. But for the most part, the same exact code base uh, targets both the Graal VM and the Substrate VM uh, with very few modifications. Uh, so there is some future work here. Um, the Substrate VM currently doesn't support compressed oops. Uh, this is something they're aware of and they're going to be fixing. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, it's an optimization that JVM already has, 64-bit uh, JVMs. So pointers are going to be 64 uh, bits wide. But if you have a heap smaller than 32 gigabytes, you can actually represent those in 32 bits. Uh, so the, the Substrate VM hasn't copied that optimization over yet, but when it does, uh, pointers will consume half the amount of memory, cache lines will be improved, things like that. Uh, they're looking to improve their array handling I already mentioned. There are things we can do on the Truffle Ruby side too to take better advantage of Substrate. Um, currently, we're only building in the core library into the image. Uh, we could do the standard library as well. Uh, there's a few hurdles there, but there are things we can clear. Um, there's more stuff we could pre-compute and push into the, the native image generation process that we're not doing yet. And both of those would help improve our startup time a bit further. Uh, we ought to be able to reduce our overhead calls uh, to, to native functions as well. So uh, I mentioned where you have this uh, truffle NFI thing for making native calls, and that's really cool. But since we're building a, a static image, we ought to be able to just statically bind native functions and call them directly and avoid some of the overhead with dispatching those calls. And um, to preempt it a bit, <laughs> uh, we're often criticized for two things. Uh, one is our startup time, and the second is our memory consumption. Uh, we actually haven't really spent any time looking into memory consumption yet. Um, but we believe that the Substrate VM uh, can also solve that problem for us. It's something that we need to look into a bit more. Uh, I have some slides here just to, um, when I make them available, uh, so you can look at them. And uh, so here it tells you how to run the Truffle Ruby SVM binary. Uh, here are some information on our benchmark environment. Um, I've provided some links to related talks if you're interested in learning a bit more. Uh, this here is a, a picture of some of the Graal team. Uh, the, the Graal VM team at large is actually a, a little over 50 people now. Uh, Oracle's uh, invested some significant resources into the various projects here. Um, so these are a lot of the people that were involved, but not all of them. Uh, we've had some alumni, we've had interns, uh, we have university collaborations. Um, the basic point here is, is this is a lot of work and way more than I'm able to do on my own. <laughs> um, so I'd like to just acknowledge the efforts of uh, the other contributors, uh, in particular on the Truffle Ruby team. Uh, there's Chris Seaton, Peter Halupa, Duncan McGregor, Benoit Delos, and Brandon Fish. And from the Substrate VM team, uh, Voyan Yavinovich was really helpful in pulling this talk together. And uh, yeah, here's my contact info. I love talking about this stuff. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Truffle Ruby, please reach out. Uh, if you're interested in trying to run your, your application 
or your library with Truffle Ruby. Uh, we're always looking for new use cases. I'm happy to work with you and uh, see if uh, your dependencies work with us. If not, uh, we can try to get that resolved. Um, and Truffle Ruby is completely open source, so you can uh, also check out the project. And uh, yeah, that's it. If anyone has any questions, I think we have a few minutes left. Uh, question was, how is Rails support? Um, <laughs> So that's coming along. Uh, the problem for us is the database adapters. Um, so Truffle Ruby is uh, it's a new implementation, and the database drivers uh, basically are shipped as extensions. Uh, there is a pure Ruby version of the Postgres driver, but for the most part, the, the database drivers have a native component to it. Uh, so MRI has. Um, native extensions for all the drivers, and JRuby has uh, native Java extensions for all the drivers. Uh, the problem is, is the extension APIs aren't really APIs. Um, an MRI extension literally is taking MRI's internal functions and allowing you to call into the runtime. Uh, and the same is true of JRuby with Java extensions. So Truffle Ruby has its own runtime. We're not implemented as MRI, and we're not implemented as JRuby. <laughs> um, so our options were pick one of those and become compatible with it or try to convince the ecosystem to adopt yet a third extension API. Uh, we've decided to go down the path of uh, working with compatibility with MRI, which means we're now taking um, functions that implement MRI and pretending they're an API and stubbing in our own implementations of them. And that work's been progressing nicely, but it's a really large surface area uh, because there's no defined public API. We need to just figure out what people are using and then support them. Uh, and that's how we've gotten OpenSSL and the JSON extension and Noco Geary running. Um, so it's really just a matter of time at this point. Um, the way we're doing it is with yet another Truffle language called Sulong, uh, which is an LLVM bitcode interpreter. So we use Clang to compile the extensions down to LLVM bitcode, and then rather than generate machine code from that, uh, Sulong interprets the bitcode, generates AST nodes, and we use Truffle's uh, interop functionality to combine that with the Truffle Ruby AST nodes, and then uh, just all works together really nicely. Uh, so uh, we, we have issued our first SQL call uh, with the MySQL adapter. Uh, we're making progress with the Postgres one right now, and uh, I believe someone's been chipping away at the SQLite 3 one. But once that, that's done, uh, we, we really should be close to running all of Rails. The rest of it, like Active Model, Active Support, uh, Action Mailer, we handle those well. Spring is going to be problematic. Um, I'm not sure if we'll ever really run that, but. Um, we might be able to do it with the uh, Substrate VM image. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I'm not sure if that got picked up. So basically the, the question was is if uh, startup time dominates the application profile, uh, why didn't the Hello World application show uh, a larger effect than uh, running the test suite, which you would think pays the startup time once and then continues to run tests? Um, as it turns out, that test suite uh, does forking and execing, so uh, you actually pay the startup time multiple times throughout the course of the run. Uh, and then um, a secondary effect is garbage collection. So when you're running Hello World, uh, you exit very quickly. There's not an opportunity to generate a whole lot of garbage. Uh, the Substrate VM garbage collector is different than the JVM one, um, and we haven't tuned it quite as well yet. Uh, so the question was, if you're uh, statically linking the JDK into the resulting binary, does that limit the uh, Java calls you can make from Ruby, right? Um, so we do have to forego the Java interop feature I mentioned, uh, because that relies on runtime reflection. Uh, the Substrate VM actually recently gained uh, limited reflection capability, so we might be able to do uh, start providing interop for classes that are already linked, but uh, we can't dynamically load classes. Uh, so if uh, you're a Java developer, you, you might be accustomed to uh, dropping a jar in and 
implementing like a new logger interface or something like that, um, you wouldn't be able to dynamically load code. Uh, but from the perspective of Truffle Ruby, uh, what we need from the JDK is known in advance, so uh, we don't have any problems that way. Um, so the, the question is, what did Oracle hope to get out of this? <laughs> um, so I work for Oracle Labs, which is a research group within Oracle, and our mandate's a bit different than what you get from the product groups. Um, so we're supposed to um, kind of identify and um, investigate new technologies that could be useful to other product uh, groups. Uh, I think it's best to maybe look at this as the Graal team as a whole. So uh, we have uh, implementations of JavaScript, R, Ruby, uh, we have this Sulong project for LLVM Bitcode. Uh, we have the native function interface. We have Truffle. We have Graal, which is our JIT compiler. We have the Substrate VM. And all these things kind of work together with one another. Um, so the various languages help improve the development of both Truffle and um, uh, Graal. Uh, if we only had one language, you risk overfitting and things like that. Um, so Graal is actually now shipping as part of Java 9. Uh, so some of this is already starting to trickle its way back up into other parts of the organization. Um, but yeah, uh, I think that's about it. Um, I don't know if that answers what you're looking for. OK, um, so I think the question is, is um, you're going to spend a fair bit of time doing the native image generation. Uh, how does that compare to the time you save from startup? Uh, I think it's best to think of this like what you would do with MRI. Uh, so you would compile MRI, and then you don't compile it again unless a new version is released. Uh, so you're not going to compile Truffle Ruby with uh, the Substrate VM every time you run your application. What we're compiling is the interpreter, not the application being run in the interpreter. Um, so we actually ship pre-compiled versions with the Graal VM distribution I mentioned previously. Um, but if you wanted to build it yourself, uh, you could, but you would only rebuild it if you actually modified any of the, the core implementation files. Uh, so the question is, because we implement Ruby in Ruby, does that limit the ability for application code to monkey patch core classes, right? Yeah, well, because it's compiled, yeah. right? Like, you're not interpreting Ruby when you have ASP that you Uh Right. Uh, so, uh, there's no difference by the time we start running end user code, because all we would have done otherwise was parse the code and generate the AST anyway. So we're just cutting out that parsing and AST generation phase. When we start running end user code, at that point, our core libraries are already initialized. And if you want to monkey patch them, um, that, that works just fine. Uh, so the question is, is uh, do we want, uh, uh, have we looked at using, I guess, kind of an application cacher uh, launched, yeah, background daemon for running things faster. Um, I guess I haven't looked at it too much. I know there's uh, like drip for just Java applications in general, uh, and you could do that for um, Truffle Ruby probably. Um, but our approach was to just try to deal with startup time and you know do what MRI is able to do. Uh, I guess even with MRI, you kind of do this with Spring and Rails, but um, we're going the substrate route, and um, maybe maybe drip would work, but not entirely sure. All right. Well, thank you, everybody.